the stories that make up Iowa's identity. For me, Iowa means peace, tranquility, supporting each other. Are your stories. His will and determination to live a full life. When I was at my lowest point in life, battling cancer, I cleared that driveway that you came up. And Local 5 is there to celebrate them with you. This is our family heritage. I look at that as kind of a unique legacy that we'll all leave. Watch more of your stories on Local 5 News. A sellout crowd of 15,000 is on hand to watch the two top teams in Iowa girls basketball battle it out for the state championship. Big moments like this. A full house at Veterans Memorial Auditorium back in 1968 were normal for girls high school basketball games in Iowa. And tonight the fans in this vast auditorium will be joined by many thousands more watching on a huge television network reaching into nine Midwest states. Girls basketball was first played in Iowa back in the 1890s. Not long after uh, 1920 is when we host our first state girls basketball tournament in Iowa. Um, so, and it's the, it was the first hosted anywhere in the nation. Immediately after the game, two of the respectable Audubon boys grabbed me and hoisted me up in the air and carried me around the gym. They did it to honor me, but I didn't appreciate it that way. <laughs> University of Iowa associate head women's basketball coach Jan Jensen has a pretty good idea of what it was like back then. Her grandmother Dorcas Anderson paints a vivid picture in her diary entries from her playing days. In another minute the game was won by Audubon. A wonderful pass from Masterson to me. To shoot the basket it saved the day. In this game I made nine points. Anderson was a talented basketball player and even won a high school state championship. But most of all she loved the game. I can be glad, however, that my last game was well played as I made 18 of the points scored for Audubon. After this game, I cried to think it was my last game. Yes, it was like saying goodbye to my very best friend. Contrary to the national societal norms at the time, rural Iowa communities encouraged girls to be physically active. Even though there were gendered roles, there was a lot of expectations for women to be active participants in their communities and their schools, that type of thing. Playing sports was a way to do that, and it's something their communities took great pride in. Well, luckily in the state of Iowa, we really had good support for girls basketball, and they weren't the same games. The women were playing six on six, the guys were playing five on five, so there wasn't that direct comparison between the two. Leaders like E. Wayne Cooley, who became the executive secretary of the Iowa Girls High School Athletic Union in 1954, also played a big role in advocating for girls' participation in sports. However, other states didn't share Iowa's love for girls' basketball. Athletic and educational opportunities weren't afforded to girls and women the same way they were for men, which led to the historic passing of Title IX in 1972. Inadvertently, Title IX marked the beginning of the end for the six-on-six -six game that Iowans loved. You could kind of feel six-on-six -six was on the way out um, due to not only the threat of lawsuits, um, because some girls were not getting the opportunity to shoot the ball, therefore they felt like their scholarships were uh, less. Between legal battles and a growing desire from girls to play five-on-five, -five, the final six-on-six -six game in Iowa was played in 1993. The six-on-six -six era is a shining example of how Iowa was ahead of its time when it came to supporting girls' sports. While Title IX was the first federal step towards progress in the fight for gender equality in sports, the groundwork was already laid by women like Dorcas Anderson, who dared to defy the status quo by playing the game she loved. She'd be so proud. I know that, and so excited about the progress, but also knowing we still have work to do. All season long, it seemed like it was going to be when, not if, Caitlin would break Kelsey Plum's all-time scoring record. When she came up just short on Sunday, it seemed pretty obvious that it would happen on Thursday night. I don't know if anybody thought it would happen two minutes into the game. She knew the whole way she was going to shoot it, and she left no doubt whatsoever. Three shots was all she needed, and three shots was all she took. A perfect three for three to start the game to blow the roof off of Carver Hawkeye Arena. Clark, no matter what, was already in college basketball royalty, but now she stands alone at the top of the record books. I'm just really grateful, um, thankful for everybody that came out tonight and supports our team night in and night out. Uh, this wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for these girls standing right here, my coaches, my family's over here. Uh, they let me be me every single day, and uh, I'm just lucky I get to wear Iowa on my chest. It 
it was another historic moment in Hawkeye history. Electric, that's, that's the best word to describe it. There's nothing like it. Fans from all across the country come to see the star wearing 22. I mean, she's fun. She, I mean, she's just she's joyful to watch and and she's 18 points away from the record, right? So I mean, what's better than spending your birthday with 15,000 of your fans for one moment? Seeing her break the record and everybody just standing up and yelling. That leaves a lasting impact. Uh, it's been awesome. I mean, she's she's just the best. There's nothing better than her. In a sold out arena with tickets averaging $577, it's a must see opportunity, especially for one fan from Dallas on his birthday. Like if you've seen the game on TV, it's one thing, but to actually be here in person, you have to experience it. And when Caitlin announced it, she declared for the WNBA, WNBA draft, I was like, okay, I got one chance. This is my weekend, happens to be, happens to be my birthday. And I was like, here we go. And fans say each game just gets better and better. I love seeing her hit the logo threes. Fluyan, Fluyan, Fluyan. A strong team Punto. is held together by a confident leader. And Alejandro Pina. I'm captain, owner, founder, and CEO, and CFO. Does it all. Yes. It's been like this since she formed Escaramuza Chara Quetzali earlier this year. I think we didn't know at the beginning what huge responsibility and commitment was going to be because none of us have taken vacation since January. <laughs> Escaramuza Chara is the only all-female event in the equestrian rodeo-like sport of Charadilla, considered the national sport of Mexico. Alejandra's teammate, Wendy Murillo. Well, I've been going through ups and downs and all the craziness <laughs> with Alejandra. Loves horses like her teammates, and she's proud of who she is. I enjoy showing my traditional roots. So my parents both come from a small ranch in Mexico, and I didn't grow up around it, but I grew up watching it. Proud of their roots and proud of each other as they hope to inspire others right here in Iowa. In Iowa specifically, it's such a male-dominated sport and we're the minority here. I love it. I love showing men that women can do it as well. And I love how we're also like role models to not just other people, but to other little girls. That are like, yeah, we can ride horses and we can ride horses better than the men. And soon, it won't just be little girls in the United States looking up to them, but also little girls with roots just like theirs in Mexico. We knew we wanted to be part of a team that wanted to take it to the next level. So the goal when we started this was that we weren't just going to be here and do like fun shows. Like we wanted to go out there and compete. So that's why we went to Chicago, we went to Minnesota, now we're going to Mexico. Like we wanted to be part of something wholesome that was going to take it to the next ne level and be professional about it. Making it all the way down to Mexico to compete, that's like a huge thing. It's, it's been my dream since I was a little girl to go and compete in Mexico and compete against one of like the best teams out there. Pinas! Discipline and practice. Our coaches whipped us into Good shape. Job, has led the way no matter where they've traveled to compete and helped this team reach a milestone. It's where the best of the best will be. And for us to just be in that arena with them is such a huge honor. But the winning secret, the heart and soul of this team. I'm like basically an only child and now I know how it is to have many sisters and a huge family. Is the bond they have with each other. Cinco minutos. In Des Moines, she knew her. Local 5 News, we are Iowa. Donna Albro served in the military from 1961 to 1964. At the time of her service, women were not allowed in combat. But this didn't mean Albro didn't have to fight for her position. At that time, women were not allowed to go into the military unless they had parent signature. Well, that really bummed me out. And neither my mother or my father would consider signing. They felt the military is not for a woman. Tina Carter Shields started her career as an Air Force firefighter in 1980. In the fire stations, you know, you ran into 
Uh, there is usually one female, maybe two if you're lucky. Both women served decades apart, but both served at a time when dedicated care for women, physical and mental, didn't exist in the Department of Veteran Affairs. They were forced to deal with tough experiences alone. During that time that I was in, you're trying to figure out when that you were feeling like you were discriminated against, what is it from? Are they treating me this way because I'm an African American or are they treating me this way because they think that I'm a lesbian? You know, and it was difficult. Christine O'Hearn is a nurse practitioner, Army veteran, and former reservist. She too fought discrimination, but at home from her husband. He told me I couldn't do it. <laughs> And so I was like, mm hmm, watch this. Two years after Christine signed up in 1992, the VA began providing gender specific services like pap smears, breast exams, and birth control. We see the VA hospital as a, it, maybe it was grandpa's hospital or my brother's hospital. We don't see it as some place that women come. I think that those are, we have to change those um, misconceptions. Christine, Tina, and Donna answered their nation's call, created a place for themselves in a male-dominated military, and they hoped for change. And that change started when the three decided to work for the VA after active duty with the goal to create an awareness for women's care options in the VA. Any female veterans that I know, I tell them, come on over, you know, because you can get just about everything that you can, uh, that you need here. September 14th marks 100 years of health care for women veterans. Care that's improved with each decade, highlighted by the message of three extraordinary women who promise no matter their circumstances, no woman gets left behind. They have whatever you need to make you whole physically or mentally. 43.1% of small businesses in Iowa are owned by women. That's according to the Small Business Administration. One of those women-owned businesses here in Des Moines says business mentorship is how they got their ideas off the ground. In 2021, Caitlin Hanley and her business partner, Emily Zambrano Andrews, who are both certified midwives, opened the Des Moines Midwife Collective after noticing what they say was a lack of resources for expectant mothers. Emily and I decided, well, if our ideas are so good and if these things are so needed in the community and we have the bandwidth, let's just do them ourselves. Hanley says she and Zambrano Andrews wanted to give women more options for their health care, but knew nothing about starting a business. So they got connected with SCORE, an organization that provides entrepreneurs with experienced mentors. They matched us with a mentor, so even, you know, well before we opened our doors, about six months before we opened our doors, um, we were meeting with our SCORE mentors and they were asking really refining questions that made us think about things and, and giving us guidance. She says that includes elements like accounting, marketing, and business planning. Anyone that has a mentor or a business coach, that business is twice as likely to succeed after five years than not. Paul Koeniger has been a mentor with SCORE for more than a decade. He says the biggest mistakes entrepreneurs can make is not asking for help. They don't take the time to study, to decide whether or not is my business feasible. And that's why so many businesses fail. Hanley says the continued mentorship from SCORE has been essential in helping her business succeed, which can often be more difficult for women-owned businesses. There are some, you know, additional barriers for women uh, starting their own businesses and uh, you know sometimes that may even just have to do with the demands that they have at home or you know with family or raising kids uh, because it takes a lot of time and investment to run uh, a business and to start it up. For nearly five decades Joni Arnett has greeted visitors inside the Capitol sharing her knowledge and love of this building. After 47 years most people may get tired of their office, but not Joni. As I'm walking in, I always look up to the building, and um, I never lose sight of the, the privilege it is to work here, and that is the truth, and I hope everybody that works here feels that way. A privilege that Joni says came to her as dumb luck after high school. A friend was a tour guide, and the director offered Joni a job, too. I thought, oh, I'll do that, because it was part-time. I thought, oh, I'll do that till I figure out what I want to do. I've just never left. Over the years, Joni's career has evolved. For the last 25 years, she has served as tour guide supervisor. In that time, she has seen this building go through a metamorphosis of sorts. Once bland and dirty, as she called it, to the masterpiece it is today. So when I first came to the Capitol building, uh, every single wall in this building was painted white. All of our beautiful designs that you see today had been painted over. They were painted over as WPA projects, painted over again in the 50s and 60s. Our restoration painters have been working for more than 
40 years to restore all these beautiful designs. She points out small details that may go unnoticed to the untrained eye. Each day, a new chance to get lost in the history and the beauty under the Golden Dome. Some days I really love to talk about the glass floor. Some days I love to talk about the history. Some days I love to show the law library. Well, actually, every day I love to show the law library. It's absolutely stunning. Uh, but some days I want to talk about how government works. Or some days we're in the Secretary of State's office talking about the Constitution. And her favorite part of the job, sharing this beloved symbol of Iowa with the rest of the world. You know, we get visitors from all over the world. Uh, we get visitors from many European countries where you would think that the architecture would, this would not rival anything that they have in those countries, but it really does. Uh, people always say the same thing about our building, that it just really is a beautiful, beautiful building. There's no telling how many faces Joni has greeted, how many eyes she's opened to this treasure on the hill in Des Moines. And as many times Joni has seen all of this, the beauty and the story of this building not once lost on her. Stephanie Angelson, Local 5 News. A little intimidating, but I'm hoping to do the job well. It's a feeling that comes over Anita Rollins that. after the newly sworn in city council member sits in the chair she'll occupy for the next few years. Rollins will represent the city's third ward, but what makes this week and position so special for her is... I am the first African-American woman to be on Ames City Council. Rollins' background was, includes journalism, so previously working for Iowa State University and sitting on the City of Ames School Board. Here she is as a board member, presenting her daughter with her high school diploma. But in the elected position she has now, she says she does have mixed emotions. Because on the one hand, I realize that um, this is a huge milestone and I'm very humbled and honored to have been elected most definitely. But there is that other piece where um, it's sort of surprising that I would be the first. And though Rollins is the first African-American woman to be elected to the council, the first African-American man elected to the council is this man, Russell Pounds. The Ames History Museum says he was elected in the early 1970s. And Rollins says now that she is on the council, her goal is to make her board proud. To do this, she wants to make sure the best parts of Ames are accessible to all residents. She wants to work on affordable housing and she wants to reach out to more minority groups. And sometimes that means just getting out outside of the council chambers, making sure that we're identifying populations that we want to have better access to, and then um, creating those relationships. Knocking down barriers and breaking the mold, how one Latina woman is changing the ways of construction and helping out the labor shortage. Six classrooms on the left, a cafeteria on the right. Prilla DeLuca is the owner and CEO of Southeast Constructors. She says being an immigrant woman with a career in construction has at times been tough as nails. Construction has always been a male-dominated industry. DeLuca says right before COVID hit, her crews felt the effects of the labor shortage and lack of women in construction. Right now with the labor shortage, everybody's like, why not women getting more into construction. As COVID and the labor shortage progressed, so did Perla's desire to create change. That's when she decided to start an inclusive construction school right here in Des Moines. For me, this school is about bringing more women into the construction. That's where my heart lies. But obvious, it's for everybody. We are here to train people at entry level for construction. The school consists of a 12 week program. Each week, students will learn a different trade that will help them earn certifications, making them more desirable to employers. So if you come to our school, we can put you on the right path to get that job where you are going to earn more than you are earning now. League of United Latin American Citizens Vice President Joe Enriquez Henry says having the school provide certifications for different trades is going to play a significant role for Latinos in Iowa. A lot of our people work as apprentices or helpers in those trades, but they don't have the licensing to do the key roles. As for Perla, this school is her way of showing no matter where you come from or who you are, there is a place for you in construction. I want to leave a legacy where we can help people. On the beginning or right after high school when they're like, I don't want to go to college, but I want to have a career. Construction is a career. So easy solve since we don't have to rearrange anything. Leading with love. You're watching the end of the ruler, not him. It's just what Jenny Anderson does. Yeah. For 14 years, Mrs. Anderson has been changing lives and building relationships at Ankeny Christian Academy. 
I get the privilege of impacting the students with truth from God's Word at the same time that I'm giving them a foundation in their academics that they need for college and career. In her classroom, students come to learn not just one subject, but two. I became a science teacher as well as a French teacher. Anderson was recently awarded the 2023 Outstanding Educator Award from the University of Chicago, nominated by a former student. And just down the hallway from Mrs. Anderson, another former student. I've actually known her for like 21 years. Michelle Viglo met Anderson as a young girl, learning from her both in a homeschool environment and a separate Christian school in Ames. I actually was a TA in art, and then I discovered that I wanted to be a teacher. Following in Anderson's footsteps, Viglo did exactly that. Everything has a section and a color because of what she taught me. Modeling her classroom after the woman she learned from. I hope from what she taught me that every student knows that I genuinely care about them. It's that care and compassion leaving a mark on her kids. Through it all, she remains humble. All of this honor, all of these awards are not so much about me. It's more about the fact that our students remember their roots the roots that she has planted. I, th I think it speaks a legacy. I mean, what you're sharing and you're implanting in the hearts of students doesn't just last for a couple of years, it's generational. Leading with love every step of the way. At the end of the day, my kids know that I love them. Anderson's impact is sure to last for generations to come.